like to thank everybody for coming out today. Our first distinguished colloquium speaker, colloquium for the semester. And I'd also like to express appreciation to the floor for providing the, uh, the support to make this colloquium series possible. Today we're uh, pleased to have Professor Pearl Schwarzlander come as our speaker today. Uh, professor Schwarzlander Jr. is a uh, professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. And his research interests include the optimization of computer arithmetic and its application in general purpose and application specific process and design, the interaction between the LSI technology and computer architecture, and digital signal processor design and implementation. Previously, he was with TRW Systems, where he held a variety of positions including Director of Independent Research and Development for the TRW Defense System Group. He's a member of the Technical Advisory Board of the Electronics, Computing, and Information Technology Center at Queen's University of Belfast. He's the editor of seven books, the author or co-author of 65 journal papers, 270 conference papers, 33 book chapters, and a book. He is co-inventor of four patents and has seven patents. He's currently the Hardware Area Editor for ACM Computing Reviews and a member of the Editorial Board for the Journal of Civil Processing Systems. Previously, he was an Associate Editor of the IEEE Transactions on Parallel and Distributed Systems, the IEEE Journal of Solid State Circuits, and the IEEE Transactions on Computers. He was the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of BLSI Signal Processing, the IEEE Transactions on Computers, and the IEEE Transactions on Signal Processing. He is currently chair of the IEEE James H. Mulligan Jr. Education Medal Committee. He was a member of the Board of Governors of the IEEE Signal Processing Society, the IEEE Solid State Circuits Council Society, and the IEEE Computer Society. He's a fellow of the IEEE. He held a Howard Hughes Doctoral Fellowship. He has received a Golden Core Award from the IEEE Computer, Computer Society and a Third Millennium Medal from the IEEE. He is a distinguished engineering alumnus of Purdue University. University of Colorado. So it's my pleasure to present Professor Colonel Schwarzman. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. I, I feel like I've just about used up my time now. <laughs> so I'll, I'll try to make this fast. What, what I really want to do, the, the, you can see the title, Fused Floating Point Arithmetic for DSP Applications. I, the talk is really a bit more than that, though. I, I'm really trying to show, uh, kind of by example, a process that was used to uh, come up with, with some, some new ideas and then get them to the point where they're ready, ready to be fabricated on VLSI chips. So, I'm, I'm going to show you the details, but, but the, it's the idea behind it that I think is really important, and that's the process. So let me get right to it. To begin with, the current environment. DSP is everywhere. What do I mean by that? Well, anything in your computer uses digital signal processing all over the place. Graphics, computer audio, video, games, uh, cell phones, uh, MP3 players, GPS, and, and those are sort of the, the uh, consumer things that we have the most contact with. But, but beyond that, biomedical, that's probably a, a big future application that, that is, is just barely beginning to, to start to happen. Uh, the the, the uh, things that the government has changed in the, with respect to the medical community means that there, there's going to be a real push for, for capturing uh, biomedical information, uh, storing it, being able to retrieve it and manipulate it. Uh, certainly, uh, for example, radiographic images being able to uh, do three-dimensional processing. Uh, I, from my background, which is, is uh, somewhat in the military and defense side of things, radar and sonar applications. 
big, big users. And, and some of the things that we were starting to work with in the, the defense world are, have, have moved to the point where uh, they're beco becoming very attractive for the uh, biomedical world. The, the idea of being able to, to uh, capture three-dimensional radiographic images and then, then scan them and dissect them uh, all, all electronically uh, should, should make it possible to, to start to detect cancers much sooner and, and as you all know, the sooner you detect, uh, the sooner you solve. And it, it's just like software bugs. The sooner you detect them, the sooner you solve them. So what is the problem? Well, the problem is that, that traditionally, most DSP has used fixed point arithmetic. Fixed point arithmetic is attractive because uh, it, it has relatively low delay, chip area is small, power consumption is low. Uh, especially 15, 20 years ago, uh, the middle thing here, chip area, that was a big thing because, well, it was supposed to be a small thing. The, the smaller we could make the chips, the more likely we could make the chips. Uh, that the, the uh, defect densities were high enough that, that it was a real challenge to make chips that had much, much uh, capability. So fixed point arithmetic was, was very good for that. But, but there are some problems. Overflow, underflow, scaling. I, I remember back when I was a kid, probably before most of you were even born, they used to televise the launch of uh, the space rockets as, they were as the U.S. was trying to launch satellites. And I'm, I'm using the word trying to launch very purposefully. I remember watching a few of them where the, the, the rocket sort of teetered a little bit and got maybe a foot or two off the pad and blew up. Or the rocket got up and, and got 100 feet off the pad and then blew up. <laughs> I remember one where, where the rocket got up and, and it, was, it was going well up into the sky and, and heading off to the east and, and all of a sudden it sort of snapped and it was pointing back towards the west. And it went a little ways and it blew up. Well, why did it blew up? Why did it blow up? That's not English. Why did it blow up? It, it blew up because they destructed it. They destroyed it because it was going the wrong direction and they were afraid that, that the missile would end up landing in Dallas. And, and I later got to know uh, one of the designers who unfortunately was responsible for that. And, and the explanation was that it, it was a case of overflow of the fixed point arithmetic for the guidance system. And, and it overflowed from a positive number to a, a big negative number and caused the missile to point the other direction. And, and the, the guy's tremendous software engineer, even before we called them software engineers, he was a coder. But, but it, it was a, a terribly devastating thing. Um, so, so there are serious problems with, with overflow. And, and probably, the, probably the, the thing that has caused me to think about this most is uh, I was talking to a person at, uh, uh, who's with the Navy at China Lake out in uh, central, well, California. And, and he said that, that they get young engineers, young Navy engineers who come in and, and, and they want them to work on uh, uh, missile, missile guidance systems uh, and I'm not sure of the exact application. Probably it's good that I don't know. But uh, he said that, that the engineers have real trouble, that, that he has real trouble with the engineers because they don't understand what's going on with fixed point arithmetic. They've gone to school. They've, they've used, used nice x86 processors. Everything's simple. Everything's floating point. Things don't overflow. But in the stuff that, that they were putting into their missile systems, things do overflow. And you can get problems that are similar to what happened with the, the uh, missile launch 
back at uh, Cape Canaveral. So he, he said that that, that that was what was pushing him to, to fund uh, some research that I was working on in, in doing floating point and, and getting it to where uh, it, it could help. So single precision floating point is a potential solution. It solves the overflow, uh, and, it, and it, it makes for nice, simple system interfaces. You, you put out a, a result that is uh, in an IEEE 754 format, and, and it goes right into the x86. Everybody's happy. There are issues, though. Delay, chip area, power consumption. Well, delay tends to not be a big issue anymore. Things are getting to be pretty fast. And we can pipeline our system, so that, that solves some of the concern with delay. Chip area, when I talk to, the, to my friends at Intel and AMD, they sort of laugh and they say, we don't care about no stinking chip area. Make it bigger. Especially the, the people at AMD, they, they've sold off their fabs and so, so the designers say, well, let's, let's see if we can make it bigger and stress the fab people and get them to the point where they panic just a little bit. Anyway, the bottom line is they're, they're not really terribly concerned about the chip size. What they're really concerned about is power consumption. So what, what might we do? Well, there's a, a concept called fused floating point arithmetic. And fused floating point, I believe, can help solve this problem. So what is fused floating point? It was first developed by Montoya and a few others, used on the IBM RS6000 about 20 years ago. It, and and uh, what they did was they developed a, uh, an instruction that was called fused multiply add. Sometimes they called it multiply add fused. So it's either FMA or MAF, depending on, on when you were working with this stuff. It, it is a single operation that computes the product of two variables and uh, added to a third. So there are three operands, and it involves a single rounding operation as opposed to the two that would be involved if you did it with discrete steps. In, in the discrete step version, you would do a, a floating point multiply of A times B. You would round and normalize that result. Then you would add that to C and round and normalize that result. Well, by fusing the operation, you you discard that middle round and normalize step. And, and in the RS6000, as I understand it, it, it uh, reduced the pipeline length by one stage. And uh, it's, it's become well accepted as a, as a really good thing to do. You, you don't want to necessarily use it to the exclusion of, of floating point multiplies and floating point adds, but it's good to have in addition to them. It, in fact, it has been added to the latest revision of the IEEE standard for floating point arithmetic, 754. So the, the logical question now is, what other operations might we fuse? Oh, that's interesting English. Well, I, I want to tell you about two. First is a, a, a two-term dot product. Multiplies two pairs of floating point data, and it adds or subtracts the products. Now, a, a normal dot product would just add the products, but uh, as you'll see, there are places where it's useful to have the difference of the products instead of the sum. So uh, we have the capability to do both. And the other is, is a fused add-subtract operation where you've got two operands and you want to have both the sum and the difference. 
Now, the, the real application for this is in FFTs and, and wavelet transforms and the like. And, and it's, well, you'll see. Trust me, it's good stuff. So a little bit of detail on each of these. The fuse dot product, this shows uh, on the left the, the discrete implementation, two multiplies, and, and after each of the multiplies, you round and normalize, and then you do the add or subtract, and then round and normalize there. So you've got three rounding operations. The fuse version just goes in and, and does it all in one shot with one rounding at the very end. So just, just realizing that we're reducing the number of rounding operations suggests that we ought to be more accurate, especially if we carry everything at full precision as we do the multiply, so we've got a, double pre, a pair of double precision results. We properly shift them and then do the addition, and, and so we can get some, we should get an accuracy improvement. And we'll look at that in a bit. Okay, so what I've shown here is that, that the fused dot product is in fact based on the fused multiply add. And if you'll allow me to step around just a moment so I can use my laser pointer. This, on, the, on the left, we have the fuse multiply add, standard fuse multiply add. There's a multiplier, there's alignment for the uh, add operation, and then the multiplier comes out and, and we go into a carry save adder, and then the final adder, and, and the whole process of normalizing and rounding. When, when we go to, to do the fuse dot product, we simply take this, this portion that was related to the add operation and, and build it up to a full multiplier tree. Then a little bit more of stuff relating to the exponent to, to do the alignment, of course. And then and instead of a three to two carry save adder, it's a four to two. The operation here indicates whether we're complementing the uh, C and D product or, or not complementing it. And then the lower half of the chip is identical. So very, very much a carryover of, of the fuse multiply add, but with the extension. So the question is, well, how does this compare? Here I'm showing the, the area, latency, and power for a discrete implementation as well as the fused implementation. And as you can see, uh, the fused is about 30% smaller. That sort of disappoints the people that want big chips. It's about 20% faster. Well, that's kind of nice. But the power is, is down by almost 50%. It's 45%. And uh, I, I need to tell you that that these are not just numbers, these, these aren't numbers that were just plucked out of the air. This was all done using industrial strength CAD of the, of the like that is, is used at the major chip companies. So it's, it's, it's good solid stuff. It, it, these were, were automated layouts done using uh, 45 nanometer standard cells. And, and all of, all of the uh, results that you're going to see here and, and through the rest of the talk were done with exactly the same technology, so, so they're all consistent values. Okay, so dot product, pretty nice stuff. What about fused add subtract? Well, discrete implementation, let's see if I can do it up closer. Yeah, this works. I've got, I take the two operands, I have an adder, I have a subtractor, the fused operation, I just pull it all together. How do, how do we actually implement that? Well, here what we're doing is we, the whole top portion of this is exactly the same. Because for both the add and the subtract, we've got to compare the exponents, we've got to find out the, the smaller significant, we've got to shift, no, we've got to find the smaller exponent and shift the significant that corresponds to that exponent down by the appropriate number of positions. 
And then, then we come down and, and with a normal floating point ad, we come down, we do the ad and, and get the result. Well, here we're going to come down, we, we do the ad and get a result. We do a complement so that we can do the subtract, we get a result. And, and there's more stuff involved with the exponent and with sign logic. But, but the whole top portion of the chip, identical. And, and that's, that's kind of the attraction. We're, we're saving a bunch of stuff that would otherwise be done twice. What are the payoffs? Well, the area drops by about 20%. The latency goes up. Whoa, we're going the wrong direction. Well, it doesn't go up by very much. And, and the reason why it goes up is, is partly that uh, we've got longer lines on the chip. We've got higher fan out uh, for, for substantial portions of the chip. And, and we've got some extra stuff down at the bottom as we, as we deal with the uh, potential catastrophic cancellation that can occur with the subtraction. The, there's a power savings. We do expect the power savings because we're, we're eliminating a, a good portion of the stuff on the top of the chip. We're, we're getting rid of half of the top of one of the chips. Half, yeah. We're getting rid of all of the top, of, top half of one of the chips. Okay, so let's, let's look at how we apply this to DSP. Uh, let me look first at digital filters and then Fourier transforms. And, but first I want to talk a little bit about the process. Uh, the first step was, was coming up with a concept. And in, in this case, I had a student uh, that was interested in the fused multiply ad. He came up with uh, some better ways to implement the traditional fused multiply ad that, that I talk about as being the start of all this. And, and that led to a nice dissertation, led to him working now at AMD, and, and in fact it led to the fact that every AMD chip from now for the next several years is going to have a new fused multiply ad that was developed by Dr. Quinnell. It also led to, to me thinking a little bit about the concept of, of where else might we use this. I was off jogging one day and had one of those slap the forehead moments where I said, you know, this, this would do very nicely for dot products. And, and one thing led to another and, and then Six months later, uh, in one of my uh, graduate classes, a student was looking for an interesting project. And I said, well, let's, let's look at doing a fused dot product. And uh, this was a student that, that uh, works full time in industry, so he had access to good CAD tools. And he said, oh, I can do that. So he, he did the initial uh, comparison for uh, the discrete versus the fused dot product. And we said, hey, this, this really is working nicely. Where else might we use it? And, and that led to, to the notion of the, the fused add subtract. And, and with both, we followed a process to try to establish the feasibility, try to confirm what we think is the feasibility. And so modeled, modeled the operations first in MATLAB, then in Verilog, verified that the MATLAB and Verilog versions match, synthesized using a, a standard cell library, and then did place and route and, and then all of the uh, characterization uh, that, that industrial CAD entails. So this, this is kind of the process we followed with, with all of the stuff that you're going to see from here on out. So let's look at doing a complex multiplier. I'm going to walk around again. What does it involve? A, a discrete version has four real multiplies followed by a pair of real adds. The complex version, or the fused version, has two fused dot products. One that's doing a subtract, one that's doing an add. 
So right away, it, it, it looks like it ought to be simpler. It looks, looks like it ought to be better. Well, is it? Well, here, here are the data. The area is down by about 30%, the delay by about 15%, and the power by about 20%. So in all regards, it looks pretty good. Now let's, let's look at a, a, a more interesting application, a sort of a more complex application. Let's look at implementing an FFT. The, the uh, approach that I'm using is uh, what's called a pipeline FFT or a systolic FFT. It consists of, of creating a, a cascade of elements where there's a computational element, a reordering element, another computational element, another reordering element, another computational element, and so on. And, and you, you put log to the base R of these computational elements in sequence, and, and you get a, uh, two, uh, uh, an R to the whatever uh, power uh, length FFT. And I'm going to look at, at both Radix 2 and Radix 4 versions of the FFT butterfly. The reordering element is something that, that I'm not looking at here. It, it's something that really is, is an, the, the best implementation is really an issue of, of how, to, uh, how to use memory to do the reordering. It's something we've looked at. It, it doesn't really relate to the arithmetic side of things. And there's a, a twiddle factor generator for each of the computational elements that, that could be done with a ROM or could be done using chordic rotation or something like that. So fairly straightforward stuff. So what I'm going to look at here are the, the Radix 2 and Radix 4 butterflies. The Radix 2 butterfly, this is a, a decimation in frequency butterfly where we, we do the add and subtract first and then, then do the... Uh, multiplication. So we've got two complex adds, one complex multiply. We can implement them uh, as shown here. The discrete version uses four adders, then four multipliers, then two adders, so it's a total of ten discrete operations. And you can, can maybe consider that to be ten rounding operations also, if you'd like. The, the fused version has two fused add subtracts and two fused dot products. Each of the add subtracts has, has a pair of rounding operations. So we've got a total of six rounding operations here versus 10. So, so it should be more accurate. We'll find out more in a bit. This shows uh, the layouts. They've been colorized to to indicate uh, which, of, which element is placed where, and that's not really the, the main issue here. The, the critical path has also been shown in white. Uh, the, the size of these on the, the slide is uh, in approximate proportion to the, the size of the uh, actual layouts. And, and so one obvious thing is that the fused is, is quite a bit smaller. As we look at the more of the results, we see, in fact, the fused is about 30% smaller in area. It's, it's a little bit faster, but the power is 40% less. So again, you know, 40% is enough of a payoff that, that that starts to get interesting. Now, let's, let's look at the Radix 4 case. There, this is, is using a decimation in time butterfly. So here we're doing the multiplies in front, and then, then the eight uh, complex add subtracts uh, at the back. And this shows the layouts and, and the results here. Uh, the area, again, drops by about, about a quarter, latency by about an eighth, and the power by about a quarter. So what's not to like? We've got something that's, that's smaller, it's faster, and it's less power. 
So let's look at error. The, the process here was to, to do a 64K point FFT, nice long FFT. And first, uh, a, a gold standard result was developed by calculating the FFT using MATLAB double precision. Then, then a calculation was done using the uh, discrete butterflies, another one using the fused butterflies, and then, then the errors are the, the differences between the, the discrete butterfly and the gold standard or the fused butterfly and the gold standard. And it's all shown on this nice busy slide. For the, for the Radix 2 case, the, the average error drops by about 20%. The maximum error drops by about a third. So that's kind of what we would expect by virtue of the number of rounding operations that we've eliminated. If, if we're doing stuff in, in full precision, and, and rounding, doing more of the stuff, more of the operations in full precision, and rounding less, we should get a more accurate result. And, and that's what we see. Similar sort of thing with the, the Radix 4 case. Here, here the average drops by about 33%, and the maximum by a little bit less, 28%. And, and the fact that these these ratios aren't consistent, that, that the average doesn't match the maximum, sort of says to me that, that these, these numbers are, are a little bit rough. And, and that's certainly true. It's, it's based on doing one 64K transform and then, then looking at the, the errors of, of the 64K complex points. And, and certainly future work needs to be done there, and, and it's in progress. Give, given a little bit of time, you'll, you'll hear about that, I think. So uh, in conclusion, fuse floating point. It's, it's these, these two new floating point operations are very attractive for DSP. I think they're uh, also attractive for other applications. It's just that, that my background is more in DSP and, and related applications. Uh, the, the advantages are that, that, that the, the complete function drops in size by about 25%. Speed goes up a little bit. Power drops roughly in proportion to the reduction in size, and, and the accuracy also gets better. I, uh, one of the things I would point out is that uh, we were not at all concerned with speed here, and that, that uh, these designs are such that, that uh, either the Radix 2 or Radix 4 butterflies can be used for, for data rates of, of about one giga sample per second with, with a couple of pipelining stages in between. There's, there's a nice place to do the pipelining and, and it's, it's a natural thing to do. So, so uh, I'm not aware of people that, that really want to do analysis at, at rates faster than uh, about a giga sample per second. But, but if any of you know of any applications like that, please let's talk because we, we, we can do things. Uh, so let me, let me turn it open for questions. This is, this is it. I'd, I'd appreciate your questions. You come. Yes? Um, your primary results are based on synthesis, and you did do apples to apples comparison. Yes. How does that scale, though, to do custom design of these units, which I would think your student at AMD would do? Well, he's no longer at AMD. He's now at Intel. Who especially wants custom. <laughs> they, they all especially want custom. Um, I, I believe that, that they should scale roughly comparably as we go to custom. Uh, the, the, uh, 
the, all of the synthesis results were, were done to the, the same level of uh, uh, utilization of the area uh, within two or three percent. And, and uh, since, since the, the functions are such that, that people have done uh, very good custom designs and, and that the same functions are used on, on both sets of chips, I think uh, the, the ratios will probably carry over pretty closely. I have a, a friend who uh, works at Cirrus Logic who, who contends that, especially for, for mixed signal chips, a custom design uh, should be uh, at, at least twice as good as, as a standard cell design. And, and I'm not sure that that holds for something that, that is like this, that's, that's all digital and, and where the, the, uh, the CAD systems have, have really gotten to where they're pretty decent. But, but I'm sure that there is a benefit by going custom. And, and it'll, it'll buy some, certainly in terms of, of uh, delay, uh, probably, probably also in terms of area. I, I would think the area uh, could improve by another 25% at least. I'm, I'm not sure what the impact would be on power. That would be an interesting thing to explore. Yes? Uh, how does it have an impact on power? So, I mean, uh, what is happening that the signal produced? I'm, I'm having trouble understanding you. Could you say so I noticed, uh, I noticed that some applications Yes. Uh, does, the, does the instructions that will be affected because you use three? Ah, uh, yes. Well, this this is is such that that most DSP is is done on not not by programming a general purpose processor, but by by building a special purpose chip. And so, at, at least the context that I'm thinking of, this, this would be done by implementing it in, in uh, custom silicon. And so, uh, the fact that we've got four operands uh, works nicely because the, the interfaces can be such that, that we're going from one element that, that puts out four results into another element that wants four results. There may be reordering element in between it takes in four and puts out four, so so it, it plugs together pretty nicely. Yes. So how will the benefit change if you go from single precision to double precision? I can't imagine wanting to do DSP with double precision, <coughs> and the reason that I say that is. 64 bits. I, I don't know of applications that need that. Maybe, maybe some of the biomedical. If certainly, certainly, uh, if we did go to double precision, I, w I would think that the the benefits would be uh, even better, because we're we're eliminating fairly substantial portions of the chip. I, I really haven't given much thought to it. I, I, there, there may well be an application involving uh, medical images where 64 bits would, would be worth pursuing. I, I just haven't uh, looked at that at all yet, though. Yes. Is, have people looked into um, operating in one of two modes so that you do full IEEE 754 compliance with rounding normalization, or you don't, and you can skip some essentially pipeline stages and get higher throughput, and then at the end, or when triggered by some overflow or underflow or other conditions, go ahead and do the rounding normalization. 
Well, certainly the, the, the low precision floating point is, is something that, that has been used. In fact, uh, many, many years ago, I guess about uh, 30 years ago, I, I led a project at TRW where, where we built a, a high performance FFT processor for some defense applications. And, and we were using a sort of a strange little 22-bit floating point format. It was a 16-bit fraction and a 6-bit exponent. And, and for that particular application, it was beautiful. The reason is that, that, that the input was coming from a relatively low precision analog to digital converter. So we, the stuff that was coming in was either 12 bits or 14 bits. We wanted the floating point so that we could handle the, the growth, the, the, so that we wouldn't have overflow or underflow. And, and the final result, uh, a 16-bit fraction with an exponent was, was just fine. So I, I think that, that there's a lot of merit to that, and, and this could, e could be easily modified for that. Again, it, it's something I haven't looked at in that, that uh, the, the, the community around Austin really gets excited about IEEE standard floating point. And, and now that, that half precision is, is uh, part of the standard, uh, it's something we're going to have to look at. But, but I, I would think we'd have, have sort of comparable results. Uh, they, they would certainly be faster, uh, much smaller, and, and if, if I'm not sure that there's a lot of merit to, to putting in a switch to go from one mode to the other. If, if the application is such that, that you can live with the half precision, then you probably want to just build that and, and not even worry about going to single precision. Um, but there, there might be places where, where there would be advantages to, to trimming out some of, some of the stuff on signal, single precision and, and getting better performance. Certainly one of the, one of the things that uh, I think nobody likes about the IEEE standard single precision or double precision is uh, some of the rounding modes, the, the round and nearest even. There, there are a number of engineers that have bald spots right about here where they've been ripping out their hair starting at the roots. And it, you know, do we really need it? The short answer is in 99% of the time, no. But, but as Intel found out with their divide bug, you've got to be really careful about low percentage problems because they can, they can really, really bite. Yeah. Of course, one of the motivations in the beginning of the talk was moving from the fixed point to the floating point and then solve some of the, avoid some of the software issues yeah. and designer issues. Right. Maybe it's an unfair question, but can you quantify? So, so now we're, we're we may be paying more power and more and, and more delay to avoid the design issues associated right. with fixed point. Do you have any any data or even any opinion about which you know, do, you, do you gain more than you pay? Well, you if if you keep a missile from turning back and 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 uh, hitting the airplane that launched it, it's probably a worthwhile price to pay. Uh, and, but av avoiding the flip answer, uh, I, don't, I don't know the exact trade-offs. That's, that's another thing that I'd like to look at and, and intend to look at. Uh, there, there certainly is a penalty for going to floating point. And, and the penalty is, is there's a, a substantial time penalty uh, and, and anything where there is an ad involved, there's a big penalty because a floating point ad is, is, is just flat out ugly. 
or is a fixed point amp. They're they're cute little things. So they're they're sort of sort of like uh, sort of like small goldfish in a in a goldfish bowl. It's really cute to look at them. They just go scooting around. They're nice and fast and well behaved. And and you'd never say that about floating point ads. But that, that's something we need to look at. Certainly, good point. Well, I see by the clock on the wall that we're at the end. So I'd like to thank you all for letting me tell you about this. And, and I'd like to encourage you to, to let me know if you have any, any comments or suggestions. I'd, I'd sure like to hear about it.